Dutch illustrator, lithographer and designer Theo van Hoytema was born the youngest of eight children in 1863 in The Hague, where his father was Secretary General of the Department of Finance. Both of his parents died in 1870s, so he moved with his siblings to a village in Voorschoten. He initially worked in the offices of a financial business, but it didn't suit him at all, and he resolved to try to make a living as an artist. He'd drawn enthusiastically in childhood and had been tutored to an extent by an older sister, and now he enrolled for more formal training in the Dutch Royal Academy of Art. Even at this stage, it was the subject of wildlife which most engaged him, and he spent much of his time drawing the animal exhibits at the National Museum of Natural History in Leiden. He was fortunate to have an uncle who was the director of a publishing house and he helped the young Van Hoytema find commissions for various scientific publications. Although he drew and painted using watercolours and even occasionally produced oil paintings, around 1890 he became particularly fascinated by the creative potential of traditional lithography and only a year later he enjoyed his first significant success with his picture book How the Birds Got a King for which he created pages which incorporated hand-lettered text with a series of well-observed and skillfully rendered illustrations produced using the lithographic process. By this point he was making a decent living from his endeavours and married in 1893. He also produced an illustrated edition of The Ugly Duckling by Hans Christian Andersen, which quickly became a great popular success in Holland, and it was translated and published subsequently in several of the European countries with equal success. Van Hoytemer also created images as art in the form of paintings and lithographic prints, which were also popular with collectors. In 1898 he returned to Hans Andersen's tales with a strong graphic visualisation of the story Two Roosters. His mastery of lithography was abundantly clear in the images he created for this book and combined with his natural aesthetic sensibility, it contained some of his finest work. In the early years of the 20th century, collections of his wildlife-themed lithographs were published as calendars and they too enjoyed great popular success for years to come. Unfortunately, around this time, he and his wife divorced and not long after, he experienced some health problems, both physical and mental. And the only evidence I found of his work from this point onward comes in the form of his calendars, and a new one appeared every year up to his eventual death in 1917 at the age of only 54. Thomas Derrick was born in Bristol in the west of England in 1885, and in his late teens he enrolled at the Royal College of Art, later spending five years there as a tutor. The earliest verified illustration work I found is this absorbingly complex monochrome illustration from 1909, followed in 1910 with line and watercolour wash illustrations for a French edition of Les Fables de la Fontaine when he would have been 25 years old. In the same year he had another book published in France in the form of the fairy tales originally written by Madame Dolnoy in the 17th century. These images were created in a deliberately medievalist style, along similar lines to the illustrations created by Walter Crane and others some years earlier. But despite this overt influence, they made for a visually engaging series. In 1912, Derrick illustrated arguably his most distinctive work of this period, an edition of Miguel de Cervantes' Don Quixote, rewritten for French children. Why all his early professional associations seem to have been for French publishers, I have no idea, but the soft textural colour illustrations Derek created and the use of a desaturated colour palette were a considerable way distant from his other earlier, more blockish work, and they made for a visually memorable and aesthetically pleasing visualisation. In 1914, there was also the publication of the Reverend Arthur Tooth's book, The Palmer Man, for which Derrick created what were almost certainly a series of medievally plausible woodcuts, although that isn't verified. This was also the year the Great War began, and in 1917 his dramatic and I assume observational monochrome drawings for Hugh Pollard's The Story of Ypres were published, and Derrick's expressionistic illustrations added greatly to the emotive nature of the book. In 1920, he published an illustrated edition of Boccaccio's 14th-century collection, The Decameron, 
These illustrations were created with bold angular lines and flat colour and once again they set out to invoke the methods of the past. Whether the colour was added using woodblock printing or created with washes is up for debate, but either way this was another in a run of aesthetically pleasing creative successes. Strangely, other than this 1924 poster collaboration with Edward Borden and this magazine illustration from 1927, I've been unable to find more evidence of his illustration until 1930. In that year, his edition of the medieval morality play Everyman, definitely created with traditional woodcut techniques, was published, suggesting that his earlier medievalist illustrations had also been actual woodcuts. There quickly followed an unprecedented series of books, all of which featured calligraphic monochromes created in pen or brush and ink. In 1931 alone, the fairly serious-minded The Prodigal Son and Other Parables was followed by humorous monochromes for the book Cautionary Catches, written by Cyril Allington. And in the same year, Richard Dark's book Shakespeare and All That Crush was also published, and in the following year, another titled The Hilarious Universe. Derek's own book, The Muses, was published in 1933. This contained a series of elegant line illustrations which comedically illustrated the supposed attributes of these mythological females in relation to contemporary males and social interaction. Why it had taken so long for Derek's obvious talent for humour to emerge, I have no idea. But around this time, he also featured intermittently in the pages of the humour magazine Punch, in later life it seems Thomas Derrick left commercial illustration behind and increasingly concentrated on creating designs for stained glass windows and he died in 1954 at the age of 69. American artist and illustrator Marlon Blaine was born in 1894 in Albany, Oregon and by the time he was 15 he was living with his mother and stepfather in the town of Dilly some 70 miles away. Much of his biography is very much up for debate. He's known to have told lies about his origins and life, and verifiable records are far from abundant. At some stage of his youth, he lost an eye in an accident, but Blaine later claimed to have fought in World War I, even though his monocular status would have exempted him. The earliest evidence of his work was the supposedly historical, but almost certainly perverse book, published in Paris in 1923 but his career appears to have really begun in earnest in 1926 with an edition of the book Limehouse Nights by Thomas Burke, featuring a series of pen and ink monochromes with a solid yellow added at printing. Blaine claimed to be self-taught and the idiosyncratic but distinctive nature of his heavy crosshatch technique seems to bear this assertion out. In 1928, he illustrated William Beckford's Vathek, and this was followed by a translation of Hans Ewer's Sorcerer's Apprentice a year later. And in 1929, he created a rare colour illustration for the wraparound cover of John Steinbeck's novel, Cup of Gold. Blaine's 1930 edition of Boccaccio's Decameron, featuring a large volume of line drawings with a positive frenzy of cross-hatching, was published. And in a display of remarkable productivity, the same year saw the publication of his equally memorable interpretations of The Temptation of Saint Anthony and a similarly styled series for Voltaire's Candide. As the financial depression of the 30s worsened, Blaine, like many others, found the going far from easy. But by 1940 he had rallied and in 1941, using the pseudonym G. Christopher Hudson, he illustrated the book The Maniac. And in the same year, My Uncle Benjamin by 19th century writer Claude Tillier was published, for which Blaine used his own name. At some point during the 1940s, he's said to have moved to Arizona to work as art editor of Arizona Highways magazine. And from the mid-1940s onward, the evidence suggests he was working more as an artist. In the 1950s, he also increasingly got involved with what might charitably be called erotica, of the kind kept in the back rooms of shady booksellers. But in the early 60s, Blaine returned to New York, where he produced some eccentrically styled covers and a small number of interior monochromes for books by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This was his last commission work, although he continued to create paintings, 
and although no one really knows for sure when he died, it was probably around 1969 or 1970. Peggy Bacon was born Margaret Frances Bacon in Ridgefield, Connecticut in 1895. Both her parents were artists and naturally they encouraged her own precocious talent for all things visual. But in 1913, the year Peggy graduated from high school, her father committed suicide after a long and ultimately losing battle with depression and drink. Following this personal tragedy, she and her mother relocated to New York and between 1915 and 1920, she studied at the Art Students League. While there, she became skillful with dry point etching and in 1919, she wrote and illustrated her first book, The True Philosopher and Other Cat Tales Using This Technique. In 1920, she married American painter Alexander Brooke and following a year in London, they returned to the USA and divided their time between Greenwich Village and Woodstock. At this time, it seemed that she concentrated more on her work as an artist and enjoyed success with her socially motivated etchings. Her next published book appeared in 1928, and it was another of her own, Mercy and the Mouse and Other Stories, which was a great success. A year later, she published another book, her own story in verse, The Ballad of Tangle Street, which wasn't cat-themed and much closer to the images she'd seen success with in her art prints. It featured a series of comical crowd scenes which indicated a significant talent for such work and she continued to exploit this facility in other projects. In 1930 she illustrated Margaret Halsey's book Malice Towards Sun, a highly comical account of an American trip to England and France. Whether Bacon travelled with the author I don't know, but her images were certainly keenly observed. In the 1930s and 40s, she also taught extensively at various art institutions, but continued with her own creative output, and she returned to Cats for the Story Buttons in 1939, at which point she started to create her illustrations with crayon, which led to an altogether more textured look to her images. But equally unexpectedly, she used an expressive scratchy pen and ink technique for her illustrations for 1945's Flight from China, written by Edna Lee Booker. In 1952, she illustrated The Leftover Elf by Elizabeth Stoltz, for which she returned to the use of crayon, following which she seems to have been concentrating more on her career as an artist, until a decade later, when she illustrated Faith McNulty's Holy Cap. She then remained fairly prolific with several more books during the 1960s including Rama the Gypsy Cat written by Betsy Byers and in 1968 she published another of her own, The Magic Touch, which was surprisingly devoid of cats. This may well have been her last published book and sadly in the early 1970s her eyesight began to fail and inevitably she was forced to retire from both art and illustration and Peggy Bacon died in 1987 at the age of 91. That's the end of this video and I hope to see you with another very soon.